Welcome everyone. I am Federica Bressan and today I'm in the brand new studio of the Ghent University Museum in Ghent, Belgium. I am here with Martin van Dijk, Professor of Philosophy at Ghent University and Director of the Sarton Center for the History of Science at Ghent University. Welcome Martin. Thank you, Federica. Thank you for accepting my invitation today to talk about science communication, not an easy topic. This year, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the news media have been filled with science talk. Scientists and science itself have been caught in the crossfire of the urgency of the situation, the right of people to know, to be guided, to know what to do, the media. And overall, we can say that we have heard more criticism towards science and science communication. During this year, when scientists were the target of such criticism, I actually asked myself, when did this start? When did the expectation that science communicates to the citizens like this started the education of the public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, in a way, one could say that as long as there has been science, there has been communication about science by scientists. You know, Galileo wrote a dialogue for a reason, right? That's a specific form to communicate with a specific audience. And at the end of the 17th century, when Robert Boyle, one of the founders of the Royal Society, died, he was a very rich man. Part of his will went to establishing a lecture series, the Boyle Lectures. And in the 18th century, in all these fancy Enlightenment saloons, well, a lot of the talk was about science. So in a way, there has always been expectations that scientists communicate. And science has always been part of a broader culture. And there has always been this interaction. I think what has changed is the specific nature of the expectation. For example, when you look at these Boyle lectures, they were specifically established to talk about the relation between science and religion. Boyle saw these as a moment where one could reflect on the ways in which science was useful for grounding religious belief. And well, part of the popularization of Newton's theories went through these Boyle lectures. But so you see there is a specific interest in the communication of these scientific results, establishing how they relate to religion. If you look at science communication today, it's obvious that there is a different set of expectations in play. And I would say that one thing that you need not underestimate is how new the fact is that science has become an integral part of government. And this is, broadly speaking, a post-Second World War evolution, that the way that the state is being governed depends heavily on input from scientists. And the expectations nowadays with respect to science communication have a lot to do with this kind of relations. Because if a government puts into place new policies, it wants to legitimize these policies. And part of the process of legitimation go through the traditional political processes, voting and things like that. But part of the legitimacy of, of contemporary government also depends on science. If a policy is put into place with respect to, well, health, uh, which is, of course, what's at stake these days, well, the, 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 the way that the policies are being legitimized is by referring to science, to scientific input. We need to do this because science has taught us X and Y. And this is why we need to put these kind of policies into place. So given that the, the whole political legitimacy depends on science, of course, to, to, to communicate the legitimacy of the policies also requires communicating something about the input into these policies, so about the science. And this, of course, also goes hand in hand with the fact that, and this is again a post-Second World War evolution, that science is being heavily funded by the state. So again, there is this expectation like you're being paid massive amounts of money and you need to do something in return. And part of what you do in return is, of course, delivering the goods in, in, in terms of input for policy. But the other side is also helping establish the legitimacy of the policies being based on the scientific input. 
So, for example, if you then look at the crisis now and the need for science communication at the moment of the crisis itself, this has a lot to do with trying to establish the legitimacy of the policies being put into place. So that would be like the way I would put this into a historical perspective, that, that this, the new thing is the very intimate relation between government, the way a state is being run, and science. And that's a new thing. And this has changed the nature of science communication and the expectations about science communication. Communication is a two-way street, they say. But science communication seems pretty much a one-way street from the science, the scientist, to yeah. the citizens who are not scientists, because scientists are citizens too. Do you agree? Do you think that when we say science communication, we are actually thinking more of a dialogue? Yeah, well, in a way, it's natural, right? If a scientist is being asked to talk about his own field of expertise, he's immediately in a situation of knowing more about it than the person's asking or the society asking. It's very natural to settle into this kind of explaining position. You don't know, you're ignorant, it's not your own fault, you haven't thought as hard about this as I, you haven't had the time to investigate all the details, I have, so let me explain. So in a way it's a natural mode and it, it does Well, it does play a, a legitimate role, I would say. But given what I just said about this science communication being driven also by the goal of legitimizing policy, government, then of course a different set of issues come into play, right? Because the way we want our policies to be legitimized also depend on democratic ideals. And there, this kind of, there is someone who's in a position of, ex of exception, the scientist, that, that is in tension with this kind of democratic ideals about legitimizing uh, policies. And so at least there is a tension that you can see there. But going further on that line, I would say also for um, the scientists themselves, There, 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 there is a good reason to start thinking if they are being in this role really along the lines that you point out. Communication in the end depends on, on, on interaction. And if, if you realize that what you're doing is, is not just explaining something, but explaining something because it plays a role in the way that people are being government, in the way that, that, that a state is being organized, then of course you, you need to be, or there, there is, I think, a reason to be open to the kind of questions that will come back about relevance. And this is, I think, the point where science communication really can become a two-way street. So when it's about information, of course, the scientist knows more. He can give information that the lay audience doesn't have access to. But when it's about determining the relevance of this information, why do we think this is interesting to know? Then the scientist still ha has an interesting perspective, but he doesn't necessarily have the last word. Then there is, a, I think, a space for a legitimate interesting conversation to be had about relevance. And when we're talking about relevance, a set of issues having to do with values and, and broader expectations enter the conversation. And we all agree that this is something that the scientist is not necessarily in a privileged position to talk about values. So that's, that's I think, where the, the, the interesting um, input in, in how to think about communication as a not just an explanation, but also about well, a conversation, that a conversation about relevance of information, about results established. The Ghent University Museum, where we are sitting today, does not just display the achievements of science, but by design, it decided to represent the uncertainty that keeps pushing the research forward, the failures we learn from those too. 
So the museum shows how science truly operates, the processes of science, and this is absolutely useful and interesting approach. So well done. Nowadays, when the news media talks about how the vaccine for COVID-19 is being researched. They explain how a vaccine is developed, the different stages and when is it safe and so on. It is not always clear to me what is the purpose of informing the population so much about the behind the scenes. For the trust I personally have in the system and in the science, I would be fine in just being notified when the vaccine is ready, if you know what I mean. It's interesting to know that behind the scenes, but it's such on a daily basis that we get the type of information that there must be more than one reason for that. I think that it it's something that has to do with trust in my view. By showing what you're doing, then you will gain the trust of the people when the vaccine is ready, that you did everything fine, as opposed to black box and here is the vaccine ready. So it's again not about educating the public, but gaining a trust. There's something at stake. What is your take on that? Yeah, and, and I do think it, it, it uh, fits in nicely with what I said in, in my first uh, reaction to your question. Because again, one of the functions it does play is this legitimizing role. Indeed, we do have a democratic ideal of transparency. We want our policy processes to be transparent, right? And if these kind of, of scientific developments making a vaccine become part of policy. And it, it has become integral part of policy, not just that we need in the end a vaccine, but also how it is being developed. You know, who's being paid to develop it, under what kind of conditions it will be distributed. This is all part of policy. And given that for policy, we do have a very strict expectation, this norm of transparency. It also naturally, um, the, the, the scientific process becomes held to the same kind of norm to, to a certain extent. So that's at least part of this drive towards putting it all in the open, I would say. And then, of course, you can debate whether this actually helps the process of legitimation or not, because as you point out rightly, in the end, it's about trust. And, and legitimacy has a lot to do with trust, right? We want to be able to trust our government to make the right decisions when it comes to, for example, distributing a vaccine. And if we feel that we can trust them, then this will be part of the legitimacy of the, the, the policies being put into place. But trust is a very subtle thing. It's, it's a crucial thing in, in, in keeping together a society, any kind of society. But it's, it's, it doesn't just depend on information, right? And there is indeed an idea here surrounding these issues having to do with vaccinations and resistance against vaccination, that the answer to the resistance is giving more information. But that's, in general, not how you build a relation of trust. Trust is never just built on information. It's always also a moral notion, right? Be trusting someone is, has to do with how you feel towards this person. You feel that you can trust him or her. And the fact that you feel like this actually tells you that this person does not need to give all information because you trust him or her. So there is a deep tension between giving information and trusting. Giving too much information can actually, or this is an argument you can make, can actually build distrust, right? Why is this? Why are they giving all this information? If it would really be a relation of trust, there would be no need to do this. But of course, without any information, there can also be no trust. So that's why I said it's a very subtle notion. But what I do strongly believe about this notion of trust and also how it plays into this contemporary situation is that it's crucial to t also think about this moral dimension of trust, about what kind of relation do people enter into with each other when they trust each other. And one thing you can immediately see is that it has a lot to do with self-identity. 
tell me whom you trust and I know who you are or I know something important about who you are. And, and this, of course, from a young child onwards, it develops its own identity through relations of trust with parents. And at some point it learns not always to trust the parents, the teacher. And at some point it learns also not always. So building your own sense of identity really is navigating this world of trust. And so and you see this exemplary in resistance to vaccination. Right. It's 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 not so much about a lack of information. It is really about a struggle around identities, about who gets to define whom I am and, and how I behave. So that's really, I think, uh, central in these dynamics. And so if you want to develop ways to build trust, you better start thinking about this other moral dimension more than on just the epistemic dimension about delivering information. Even I do agree, without information, no trust. And, and I wouldn't want a government to just black box these kind of processes. I wouldn't trust that. So in the process of delivering information, sometimes because there's too much information, because there's something that goes wrong in the chain of communication, the result can be confusing. We have witnessed this year sometimes conflicting information. So there was no lack of information, but opposing opinions. And therefore, the public got confused and trust went down, of course. Do you think that this confusion, let's call it, is the consequence of having exposed along the months the process of science that was learning about the virus? Or there is something wrong that happens in the process of communication. So there is actually clear confusion. It's not the uncertainty and the doubt that drives science forward. It's confusion. Yeah, well, I, I would say that at least part of the blame is on scientists themselves. So part of the confusion is a confusion by sci made by scientists. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's how far you can extend what you do know. And every scientist does know things, does have privileged access to some pieces of information about some phenomenon under some conditions. But of course, we're not just interested in this phenomenon under these very strict conditions, like what's happening in a laboratory situation. We're interested in what to do when we go out on the street, right? And there, I think that, that, that there has been not enough attention. And this is not just a question of media. I do feel it's also a question of scientists themselves. Not enough attention about the leap it takes to go from this specific information that this specific scientist does know about a specific phenomenon to what do we do with this? How far does this travel? And so th this actually uh, feeds back into this issue of relevance that I uh, talked about a bit earlier about this communication about a, as a conversation as trying to figure out what is the relevance of this piece of information. And this is also a conversation that scientists among themselves need to have, scientists coming from different disciplines. I do know something about how a virus behaves in a lab. I do know something about how, how a virus behaves in a group of people. But how do we bring this, how, how do we establish the relevance of these different pieces of information when it then goes about determining policies, about how we as citizens will behave when going on the street. And it's clear that there is no um, strict answer to this. I don't think that, that, that science at the moment is in a position to establish what would be the right uh, kind of behavior to deal with the situation even if uh, you, you can have doubts about whether science is ever in a position, at least now we're dealing with, with a, a situation where knowledge is still so much in flux. There is so much that we still do not know that this issue becomes glaringly clear, right? So there is this big gap between what scientists do know and policies. But we still, 
for good reasons, feel that it would be stupid not to take this information into account when, when deciding on our policies. So, but I do think that there is place for something like, I don't know, a, a virtue of humility in scientists about how they talk about what they know, not because so it, it, it goes back to the issue of uncertainty. But I would say it's not what, what, what interests me most is not the uncertainty in the sense of, oh, we do not know yet. Just give us a bit more time and we'll have the definite answers. But uncertainty in the sense of, well, the relevance issue. I'm not, or, or you can never be, I think, as a scientist, very sure about how far your facts do travel outside the specific conditions in which you have established them. Of course, you do think they have a broader relevance. That's something that you've established in the lab also is relevant for what happens in the world. But how this relevance actually plays out, how well does this information travel from these very specific conditions to these broader conditions, that's something that I think will always, to a quite big extent, remain uncertain. And, and I think that's, that's the, for me, the most interesting uh, notion of uncertainty and the most relevant for understanding this contemporary uh, situation that we find ourselves in. It's probably fair to say that it's uncertainty outside specific conditions. It's not uncertainty intrinsic in scientific knowledge. It's not like that. right? Just to be clear, because when we talk about uncertainty, then it seems like we are weakening the position of science as a whole from a place of distrust. Mm -hmm. No, it's uncertainty just outside the facts, which are often limited to a specific condition. I like what you said about it's not always just the case of give us time and we'll get there. There are necessarily closed answers. So we are in a process. I would like to ask you a comment on the difference between educating in science or educating about science. Mm -hmm. For the legitimacy of the policies, I would think you want to communicate about science. This is what happens, what we do, more than teaching the notions. Uh, for that, you would watch a documentary, right, to learn the specifics. So can you talk a little bit about educating in science versus about science? Yeah. So I would disagree that when it's about legitimation, it's only the educating about science. There is a very strong notion that also when, or an expectation that we need to educate our citizens in science through high school, for example, such that they have some familiarity with basic notions in the sciences and that this is needed because we want them to be scientific literate to some extent. But, of course, uh, we cannot expect them to be very literate. And, and there there is this uh, educating about science in very broad uh, terms as a way to build this kind of, of relation of trust. So in this sense, educating about science plays a more legitimizing uh, role. We need to educate citizens about science such that they accept the role that is being played by science in our policies. It can also play a more critical role, and critical not in the sense of, of denying the value of science, the relevance of science, but critical in being able to engage with these debates about how science is being used to legitimate decisions. And there, I think we come back to the previous issue about the relevance and how far does the relevance of an established fact travel. And this is something that always needs to be settled if policies are going to be based on it. And as we just suggested, this is something that needs to remain open to a certain extent. So educating about science can also be about teaching people as citizens what is not established by science. And, and I do think that that's hugely important for a healthy democratic uh, process for, for governing our society in a way that we feel is, is legitimate in a broad sense. That this also depends on really being able to judge 
where the scientific information is, as it were, something that you cannot take on board and where it starts to become something, okay, so we know about how this fact can be established under these conditions, but actually in, in our society, the conditions are different. So that people can engage in this kind of conversation. Again, not as a way to say, so shut up, we don't need to listen to you stupid scientists, but as a way to have an intelligent conversation and an intelligent conversation in a democratic forum. And there I do think that, that this educating about science can have a huge added value that maybe it, these days it doesn't always get to that point yet. So there is a hope for a better future there. And well, let's see. In the relationship between science and society, which is constantly being renegotiated, there is this element of trust that we mentioned. You mentioned that there is a moral aspect to this. It's not just the information. I guess it's a $1 million dollar question, but could you elaborate on that? How do we fix that? Well, it's indeed a million dollar question, and I don't think it's a question specific for science or scientists. So here I do think that scientists are in the same boat with politicians, with every kind of profession, that to a certain extent, I would say that we are living at the moment when the balance of trust and distrust has been severely destabilized. And it has been destabilized by a number of processes, but none of these, I think, is intrinsic to science or to the science-society relation. It, 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 they are of a broader nature. They have to do with the way that we communicate. So I, I, I would say if there is something that I would think that, uh, okay, so, so what's happening? I would say what's basically happening is that our, our ways of communicating have changed drastically. Since of, when? Well, since things like the internet, not just the internet, but I think it's, it's the most, the clearest example of the speed with which uh, communication travels and with the, 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 the way it can reach very diverse audience and bring together people that, that could not communicate with each other. So the material infrastructure of all our processes of communication have changed in a big way. And I would say that this is probably the main driver in having destabilized the ways in which trust was ordinarily built. So that's not an answer to your question, but that's, I think, where for me the, 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 the issue lies. To conclude, I would like to ask you something from your personal perspective of a historian of science person who deals with philosophical issues, you're also a citizen and you are impacted like we all are by the pandemic. How has your experience been been exposed to this flow of information this year? But in particular, how interesting do you find the current landscape as a historian of science? Well, one of the things that uh, attract me to history of science is distance. And that's, of course, what's lacking in, in, in present day situations. So, of course, I do have this filter when I'm being confronted with these issues that I do have all these concepts and, and things in the back of my mind. But as a citizen, apparently, when I look at myself, my identity is still being defined by a good level of basic trust in our institutes, etc. So I don't feel that being a historian of science give me any special expertise to question the way that things are being done today. The expertise it does give me if you come back to me in 10 years time, when the processes have taken their time to take a clear uh, road as it were, then I feel I'm in a situation that I do have the tools to say things about that, to give extra insight in what has happened. But I don't feel that it necessarily gives me a, a privileged or a special perspective on how to deal with the present day situation. It does give me, of course, a set of issues that I feel are relevant, the ones that we've been talking about. So I, I would say, okay, these are the things we need to pay 
extra attention to. This is what we need to be careful about. So there are a set of things like that. But it's more about what are you, as it were, extra um, sensitive about, not about what we actually believe or, or these kind of things. I, I feel that that's rather disconnected from my perspective as a historian of science. This year, going through the pandemic, we have heard the word crisis many times, and science communication seems to be in a crisis too, somehow. Do we see a parallel between previous crises, not necessarily just the Spanish flu, but other crises similar in, in how it was handled, in how, you know, what was the relationship of science and society at that time? No internet? Yeah, well, so I, I, I think that Exactly, because if you go back to the time when there was no internet, that's also the time when there was hardly any strict relation between state and science in the way that there is today. So it's hard to go back and say, oh, so the, 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 the ways of communication were different. There was no internet, etc. Information didn't travel that fast. But there still was science and, and, so, and society interacting in this other way because there was not such an expectation that science would give us the crucial input into policy. That's really a very new idea, I would say. I guess the parallel I was asking you about is because I recently read a journal of the Year of the Plague by Daniel Defoe. And the human aspect was mind-blowing. Everything from people who panic, those who don't, those who turn into heroes, being generous, giving help, and those who become really selfish. And people who panic and will believe anything and will buy these remedies, you know, and the distrust also in the official sources. Numbers are odd. They are hiding. They're not. It was strikingly similar to what we were going through at the time. I think it was May or June. I was reading this. It was strikingly similar. So it doesn't have to do with science per se, but precisely. We are humans today. We have the Internet. It's 2020. This book was published in 1722. And yet... So maybe this trust issues is really transversal across um, social systems and technologies. No, so that I can relate to, right. So the issue of trust is something that any society has had to deal with and everybody always has had to deal it, with it as a human being, right? And as I said, trusting is crucial in building a sense of identity. And these are issues that hold true in 1722 as much as in 2020. The only difference, well, not just the only difference, but the one that I wanted to point to is that in 1722, you did have a royal society. But it's not the case that the government was saying, oh, we need to do this and that because the royal society has informed us about this and that. And that's the one small difference between then and now but the small difference that makes a real difference, I would say. So because some human traits remain constant through, throughout time, through the centuries, are you saying that despite that small, tiny, not so tiny detail, a flat earther today is the same type of human that resisted change in Galileo's times? Well... That, that's a question that would take me like an hour to answer. I would like to take an hour to answer the question. Let me put it like this, because there are things to be said about it, but I wouldn't be so quick in, in making it an easy parallel. And, and I would say that the flat earthers, what, what's interesting about this is on the one hand, they start from a distrust in science and the scientific institutes, but at the same time, they do discover that they need to build their own relations of trust. So on the one hand, the critical attitude always starts from, give me the proof. Have you actually proven this? What, what, what's the conclusive evidence? So it starts from this very critical attitude. But then when you look at these flat earthers, 
they have their own societies. They have their own things that they need to believe because others have told them. So they need to build their own institutes of trust. So in a way, they're rediscovering You're correct, the because they're not agnostic. They, they don't abstain from any belief. They don't believe the earth is round, but they believe that it's flat. So they just position their trust elsewhere. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so and, and that's what I find interesting about the phenomenon. What it actually shows about these dynamics of trust, distrust, but also the need for trust. And I think this is really science is is built on trust. So asking for people to trust science, well, it, it, it is something that's intrinsic to science. So science is often associated, and rightly so, with a critical attitude, with doubting. But the doubting always goes together with trusting. There is no science, there is no scientific institute without a basic dimension of trusting. And in this sense, science is a, a moral, moral thing to do. It, it, it is about morality, being a scientist. Science is also all about evidence. I can prove to you my claim, you know. So why trust is so important if science can prove its claims? Well, you tell me you have evidence and you ask me to believe that you do have the evidence. A scientist is not under normal, under ordinary circumstances, going into the lap of the other and looking over the shoulder. He's, so th the game is being played by assuming a basic level of trust. And of course, where the basic level of trust lies, this can shift. It can be that at some point we become more strict. And, and there can be a point when actually it happens that a scientist goes into the lab of the other to check whether the other scientist actually could see what he or she claimed to have seen. So it can happen. But basic science operates on trust. And also in this case, there, there will be trust because then the other scientist will need to trust the one scientist that goes into the other's lab to, to check over there. So that, that's, that's just a point about you, you can displace where the trust is, but you cannot do without this basic trust. That's where the, the science starts on this shared trust. It needs to do that. So the fact that in elementary school, children are told about dinosaurs and all sorts of stories about how our world came to be on a fideistic basis, they are just told there's no proof, is not a problem for you. It's just how things are. We have fossils, we can go and visit, but you need to trust in the first place. Yeah, because someone shows you fossils but then you still need to trust that they were found under the earth and not fabricated somewhere else, right? And, and again, you can displace the trust, but at some point you need to trust. All right, so when you contend with a non-believer, for short, we'll call it that, it's a losing game to play this game of show me and the next proof and the next proof. You will hit a wall of trust. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. I would like to thank Ghent University Museum for having us here today. Thank you to Jeremy, our sound man for the day. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for having me.